And we are recording. Three, two, one, go. Hello, hello. This is the Crokinole champion, Ignacy Trzewiczek. And this is the pod father of gaming, Stephen Bonagor. You are listening to Board Games Insider, episode 282. And we're recording this live at Dice Tower East Convention on July 9th, 2023. Board Games Insider is a proud member of the Dice Tower Network. And we had the biggest Board Games Insider meetup ever here at Dice Tower East. 35 people at least. I didn't get a final count, but it was like at least 35. I counted at one point. Showed up for pizza, beer, soda, water, and the best thing of all, Tom was not there. No Tom Basil. It was great. Ignacy, that was a great meetup, wasn't it? Yeah, the, we had no crocodile board, so I am still running champion of the game because uh, Steven had no chance to compete with me this year. We could not, you know, take the crocodile board out of the, out of the game area, so we did not play crocodile, which we normally do. However, we did play a game with the fans, which was great. We played an 18-player game quickly, because not everybody could be part of it, of In Vino Morte, which is like the scene from Princess Bride where, oh, obviously I cannot drink the wine in front of me because uh, you would have poisoned me, but knowing that you know that I know that, then therefore I have to drink the wine in front of me because you would have then poisoned, et cetera, et cetera. So you play the game like that, and it was monstrously fun, and we crowned a champion, yeah, yep. and I can't remember his name. I gotta shout him out. Do you remember his name? Paula? Paula's watching us right now. She never listens to this podcast, but she's actually watching us act like idiots and do this. Um, but I'll shout him out later in the, uh, when, we, when I remember his name. But that was so much fun, Ignacy. I thought, I thought it went really well. Everybody who showed up really loves the podcast. They were complimenting us, and I thank them for being, as we thank everybody out there for being listeners and watchers. Every time we go to the convention, people approach us and tell that they're listening and they like the show, and this is... Uh, Always shocking for me. Actually, somebody's listening to this show. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very nice. So I appreciate each of you who approached me at any convention, including this Dice Tower Con, and said nice things about the podcast. We love to hear that. Yeah, we really do. It makes us feel really good. And I wouldn't be doing this and not gaming if it wasn't for everybody out there. So thank you all so much. Meanwhile, Ignasi, tell us what's going on at Portal Games, and I guess especially what you're doing here, because your response to what you were doing here looked like it was off the chart. Yeah, I was uh, presenting here my new game, Imperial Miners. Uh, actually, I have a box with me, and since we're Ooh, recording... He's got a box, and since we're recording this on video as well as audio, people who are watching so, us can see the Imperial Miners box, and here it is as he's so pulling game, it out. So the game is already produced, and it's on the boat uh, to our warehouse in America, but I got one copy, of course, and I brought it here with my backpack. The game for all these uh, three days of the convention. The, today we are recording on Sunday. On Sunday I'm not running demos anymore, but uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday I was running demos all day long. And it was a great idea that you have put it in your backpack because what happened? Second time in a row. Second time in a row, his luggage got lost. Awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm becoming a running joke at the Dash Tower Con. Uh, people love the stories from Ignace coming to Florida without his uh, luggage. Yeah, so yes, the first day of the um, my visit in in Florida was of course buying clothes. And he had to go to Walmart again to. Uh, I have I have check, I think more. I have more clothes from Florida than from Poland in my wardrobe. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it was ridiculous. <clears throat> but yes, I was smart this year after this all this experience. So I put the Imperial Manus in my backpack with me in my um, uh, hand hand baggage uh, and uh, playing this game for these three days. Uh, and I'm coming back home very very happy. The feedback is insanely well. Like. I said it many times. We as the publishers, we believe in the game. Sure. Of, obviously, we signed the of game, course. we believe in the game. But then sometimes the game becomes flop, sometimes the game becomes a massive hit. You never know, actually. And now after these three days, I'm coming back to Poland saying to my team, we are good, we are good. It just run them at the conventions and people will play the game and, and prize the game. So I'm very, very happy. This is a new engine building game in the world of Imperial Setters. It is not designed by me, this is designed by Tim Armstrong. You might know him from Arcana Rising or Orbis, uh, so he has a couple of uh, interesting games already in his uh, CV, in his uh, uh, resume. Yes, N and now a and now, uh, new game from Portal Games. It will be our Essen release, officially Essen release, and um, pre-orders will start in August, we will inform about it. Of course, uh, in the podcast, uh, the landing page for the game is already at portalgamesus.com, so you can go to portalgamesus.com, 
and see the rule book, the artwork, the description of the game. Uh, and I need to you to play the game. We need to play this game. Well, why don't we do it like right after this? Yeah, no, I have not played it, but yeah, I just cool. kept yeah. hearing people come off the table yep. like, oh, that was great. Yep. And it plays like under an hour, right? 45 minutes. It's, awesome. it's quick, quick, very smart Looks game. beautiful. Yep. So yeah, no, we'll do it right after this. We have nothing to do after this. We're gonna do it. Over here at the Podfather of Gaming. Uh, Lots space, of gaming, I guess. Lots of gaming. Well, last week, uh, Paula and I and uh, another 200 people were on the BGG at sea <clears throat> cruise Very to cool. Alaska. Now, it was a one-week cruise, <clears throat> uh, and but they run two in a row, essentially the same cruise, though the st one of the stops changed between the two. I would have even gone on the second week as well because, I mean, I love cruising. Alaska is a to-die-for destination, but I wanted to come here, see my buddy Ignacy, uh, and game a lot. So, But it was great. Um, if you ever get a chance to cruise to Alaska, it's just incredible. Uh, and uh, while I'm on cruising, Podfather Cruise 2 to Hawaii. Hawaii, three stops across the Atlantic to Vancouver City. That's up, you go to Tabletop Events and you can go check that out. That's gonna be a nine day epic cruise. Again, also run by Jeff Anderson, who runs Dice Out Cruise, uh, who runs the BGG Cruises, so it's just good. He knows what he's doing. Um, so we're here this week and I literally did nothing but, only job I had here was to do this, to run that, to run the uh, amazing meetup. Uh, and to game, and game, and game, and maybe imbibe some alcoholic beverages. Maybe. Happy hours. And have happy hours. I every guess. evening. Every evening. Very happy. Every evening, approximately 8, 30, 9 o'clock, we started at a happy hour, physically just hanging out and just socializing with people it's right outside. The one thing great about this place, and I highly recommend the Dice Tower East Con, uh, is that it's at a resort. And they've got plenty of outside seating area. And of course, Florida is gorgeous to sit outside at night, a little warm, a little humid, but you sit outside and you have a margarita or a beer or something like that. And Ignacy, of course, does not join us. No, oh, Chevichek was there, but not Ignacy Chevichek. That's right. Mary Chevichek was there each evening hanging out. And I heard last night in particular, you told her, I can't believe you're going to happy hour instead of playing games. <laughs> and you got all angry. She, she enjoys uh, social events yes. and happy hours. And Very wine. Strange. She likes wine, sometimes beer, and you will not even touch. My wife is That's the, okay. the fun Chevy Jack. That's true. <laughs> now, it was great. It was really great hanging mm -hmm. out with Mary, actually. We've never spent that much time, and she, yeah. she got to meet Paula, which was great. And, and we had a nice well, last night, which was like kind of the final night of the convention. Today is the last day where everyone's going to leave before the night. Uh, we had like 20 people, Paula, wouldn't you say that, about show up there? Uh, and just, and I literally had to get rid of all the wine. I don't want to bring it home. All the beer, I want to bring it home. All the water, everything. Yeah, it was everything. The, the happiest. It was the happiest, the happiest of the happy hours. So it was a lot of fun. Just, again, just socializing. People, just, you don't have to drink. You just come and hang out and have a good time. Um, but it was fun. And we had like um, Arcane Wonders showed up. Robert uh, uh, Van Ryder Games showed up. Uh, AJ Porfirio, uh, Julie Ahern. Um, so it was great. And well, and, and Portal Games was represented by a Mary. So. Uh, but it was other people too, just regular fans hanging out with us. All that's amazing. Great time. One more quick thing. I'm going to give a shout out to my good buddy, Martin Wallace. Everyone knows him. Noted designer. He has a Kickstarter running for Fighting Fantasy Adventures. It's based on a um, comic book series by Ian Livingstone. Who comic is, book series? It's based on a... A book series, I think. Not maybe not. Comedy. These are these are these. Uh, how you call them in English? I don't know. The uh, paragraph books, and you go from one uh, paragraph to another paragraph. Oh, is that game books? They call it. Oh, in I didn't 80s, know that. In eighties, do you remember? Yeah, uh, choose your own adventure kind exactly, of things. Exactly. Yeah. Based on the Ian Livingstone, Sir even Ian Livingstone. Right? He's a, now he's knighted. One yeah. of us yeah. have been knighted. I'm waiting for Charles to call me to knight me next. Probably won't happen, but uh, he has a he has a game based on that book series called Fighting Fantasy Adventures. It's on Kickstarter right now. Uh, check it out. I mean, Martin's a great guy. Everything I love his stuff. So, shout out to Martin for that. Let's get over to the event deck. All right. So you know, in the world of <laughs> awards, there's many there's, awards. There's always that. Guess, guess what? 
Did you did you we, discuss Origins Awards already? In we, the podcast? Did. We, yes, we did. We okay. did. So we're gonna have a little bit of a problem, sadly, right now, because since the phone is doing the recording, I can't get the internet on my on my laptop any longer. We are but we could we are, we're gonna talk about some of these items because some of them are just easy to talk about. We are experienced podcasters, we can do it. We we can we're gonna make this happen. So this is you know We're thinking on our feet. We have an audience here laughing at us as we do it too, which obviously energizes and helps us to do this. So we're not going to talk about those awards right now because I can't look at it on the internet or those awards because we're not going to talk about them. But the, but but a very big piece of news. Let's use this uh, free time <laughs> to promote the new game from Portugal. Okay, we have some very big news here that, that broke on Variety, Variety.com. Variety magazine is one of the major uh, entertainment magazines that, that in was, the world. This is entertainment, right? This is, this is not it's business a, magazine. This is like a it's entertainment. new it's actress, like, it's, new movie. Essence, what, what, what these actors are doing, big things about movies, what the studios are doing. And suddenly they have a business news. They, well, it's in between because obviously Lord of the Rings is one of the biggest IPs in the world. They reported that the Embracer Group, which we all know bought Middle Earth Enterprises in August of last year, right? They announced this right at Gen Con, basically. We all thought that they paid $2 billion. dollars. We reported on that in we this very podcast, and you trust us. You do trust us. But now we are re-reporting the correct news. We are re-reporting. <laughs> you got that. That apparently they only paid Three hundred and ninety-five million U.S. dollars. Now, still a lot of money, but the fact that Embracer they went public and I'm sorry, Middle Earth Enterprises went public and said we are ready to sell and the price we would like is two billion. They were instantly bought by Embracer, so everybody in the world assumed Embracer came in and said two million dollars, great number, we will pay right now. Not the case apparently, because Variety is telling us that the number was. Just shy of four hundred million dollars, still a tremendous amount of money, but wildly different. I I want to be very clear. This is a lot of money, obviously, but this is Lord of the Rings that will bring so much money over the years for you. Yeah. So of course I never work with such money, so I'm not the expert whatsoever. But I would say that this is not a big price. I, I, I think I'll, no. I think that's a, I think that's a steal. Yeah. I literally think. Now yeah. we don't know. I mean, because obviously Middle Earth Enterprises has their books that, um, I mean, the, physically, their financial books. Yep. They, 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 have, they have a profit and loss. We don't know it. It was privately held. It's now part of Embracer. Maybe we'll see in the future, if you look at the Embracer P&L statements, how much that, that portion of the business brings in. But I've got to think that $400 million dollars with all the stuff that is Lord of the Rings and Tolkien yep. is, is a steal. What do we know? But we will continue reporting on this because it's huge. Another interesting piece of news that came out uh, over the last couple of weeks is that Mayfair Games, right, which was purchased by Asmodee in two pieces. It was, you know, Catan Studio was purchased yep. first, and then they purchased the rest the of the rest, catalog. Yeah, we take out of yeah. And then when they finally did that, and Larry Rosny, the president and owner, retired, but they they removed. Um, the name, the brand, yeah. the brand. They, it was no longer around. Like when they purchased Days of Wonder, Days of Wonder stays as an imprint. When they purchased uh, Libelud, Libelud stays as an imprint, a brand. Mayfair Games disappeared. Yep. But out of the ashes, Mayfair Games is returning as a brand, obviously somehow with Asmodee's permission, because they own it. They absolutely own the whole thing. But um, WebSphere, i happen to remember this because I read the whole thing. I don't, can't see it on the screen here. WebSphere uh, was a publisher, a small publisher, uh, has bought the name. Uh, we don't know what portion of the games, if any, but the name Mayfair Games is coming back, which I think is really interesting because they were truly one of the first, certainly in America, to be doing these Euro games. And this is very interesting uh, case because, as you said, For Asmodee, they wanted just the games. They wanted the titles of the games. They didn't care whatsoever about the Mayfair brand. For customers in America, for you, for fans who were playing these games for 20 years, Mayfair has some value, like a brand. So for Asmodee, like whatever, take this Mayfair brand, like we don't need it. For someone else, they can build a small company into a bigger company because now if the new game is released and it has a logo of Mayfair games, 
Many fans will, oh, my favorite guys. I have oh, many guys. They're there. back. Yeah. I have them. I'll buy yeah. some more yeah. of those. So this is very interesting. Not important asset for Asmodi, important asset for someone else. They can do it with that something interesting. So interesting business news. Interesting, interesting business news. We're going to go down here to the... Uh, the news about Origins, Origins released their attendance, which is great. Now, um, um, some cons don't release attendance figures at all. I believe PAX only hints at it. Gen Con hints at their attendance. Origins gave the exact attendance, which I can't tell you now, but I can tell you the Origins attendance was up 38% from the previous year, which is fantastic. I mean, that's that a- insane growth. That's an insane amount. Now, it wasn't quite as big, as the pre-pandemic 2019 year, but the fact that Origins has had such a big jump bodes well for them, because it, it was not looking particularly good over the last couple of years. So what you are saying that their last year was very, very poor, and yes. then they just getting back. Yes, so okay, poor year, poor. 30, so they're still below, pan, but I mean, a lot of places are still not quite at the 2019 levels, but this number at least puts them in a healthy position. I'm sure they made money where last year they probably lost money on the entire thing. Speaking about the conventions, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, there was the biggest Polish convention, Percon, and they released the data as well. And the data is that they had 52,000 uniques, uh, which translated to 110. Which one was this? Percon, the biggest Polish convention. You had 52,000. Uniques. Unique. And unique and 110,000 Counted like S and one. Uh, turn styles. Yes, yeah. Wow, fifty-two thousand is, is is a tremendous. It's bigger than that makes it bigger than anything is, except for Essen and Gen Con. Yes, but uh, you have to take one consideration. It is similar to the convention called Luca in Italy. That most it is a cosplay, a manga, anime, and science fiction. And the portion of the board games is just a small part of that. Okay, so it's not really a board gaming convention. Yes, this is a science fiction, uh, manga, anime, everything a convention. So it's huge, uh, but as I said, uh, Luca in Italy also is a huge convention, but also not focused on board games. But still, if you want to go to a big convention in Poland, Percon is absolutely huge convention. Very, very, very cool. Final piece of news, which absolutely is... Uh, Earth shattering in, in the I'm, hobby game world. I'm so sorry that you don't get it. You wanted me to get it. Yeah, I, I rooted for you. Did you, you rooted for me. Yeah, did you even try? Did you buy the booster or something? Did I, you give it a try? All right, so, no? so what we're talking about first is the one ring. The one card to rule them all um, was found, right? So to, to recap, uh, Wizards of the Coast cr created a Lord of the Rings Magic the Gathering set. One of the billion cards, one of them was the one ring. And even the text on it was impossible to read unless you're like J.R.R. Tolkien because it's in Elvish. black speech, yeah. black, black, speech. black yeah. speech, technically using <coughs> Elvish writing. So, and before, you know, when they announced it, people started saying, well, how much is this going to go for this one in a billion card? You know, it's probably, could it beat the record for like the Black Lotus graded 10, which was $650,000. Well, someone, first of all, started with, oh, I'll give 50,000. Everyone laughed at the person. Then, so, then he said, okay, I'll give $100,000. People still started laughing at him. He was like an ex-football player or something like that who owns a card store. Then a real bid started coming in. And the, guy, the, the guys from Adam and Dave's Card Store, which is a big, big place out in California, $1 million, which obviously would have made it the biggest card, single card ever done in, in gaming. There's been like Babe Ruth's signed card from 1927, which is even more, but okay. Biggest card in game. Then a game store in Spain offered a trip to Spain, $2 million and a paella, a local paella. I would have done it for the paella. No, but the thing is, so it was a $2 million offer what happened here, the card has been found like days after the release, yeah. really. It was, not, it was less than a week after release. Somebody apparently found it, had it graded, right? So you put it on the glass. It's, it can never change. It was graded 9 out of 10. 10, of course, is 10 out of 10 is the perfect grade. Usually with a foil card, 
um, when it's a nine out of 10 right out of a pack, it's probably something with the foil isn't perfect. That's what I, I read about. So found. Now here's the interesting thing about this story. Not a single word has come out of the guy, whoever, or the, or the woman, whoever found it, nor from the Spanish game store that offered the two million. I haven't heard anything. So are they negotiating? Is there something going on between the two of them? So why haven't we heard, okay, well, that trip is being scheduled and <laughs> maybe, maybe they haven't even spoken to each other yet. It doesn't make sense. I mean, because I know, and you know, and Paula over there knows that that card would be on its way to Spain right now if we had it in our possession. There's no way you're keeping it on your wall for more than a day. I want my $2 million, thank you. Agreed? I, I, sure, I mean, right? It, it's, it would be the greatest thing. And if you think about this, I had this conversation yesterday, Paula was there, and we were talking about this, that if you put that on your, in your store, on a wall, you're on the bulletproof glass, right? Get the rope to the next thing. No, no. <laughs> Hold on, you put it there, that, your store now becomes a destination for gamers. Every gamer in the world who's in that area is gonna to wanna to go to your store and probably buy something while you're there. He'll probably start stocking more English games because all the English speaking jerks from America will go. So I hope that we see this thing. Now, I don't think there's this, even if it was there, it can't be robbed. And why can't it be robbed? Because you can't fence, do you know the word? You can't fence the card, meaning you can't sell it on the black market because there's only one of them. It's not like you can't fence the Mona Lisa. There's only one of them. So it, it, it's not something that would be able to be sold for any real price to somebody. Because then that somebody would then get it and try to resell. Who knows? But the point is, I think it would be safe. You put it under very, very good security in your store. And it's going to be a great thing. And you don't have it. And I do not have it. So this was also reported on in the Wall Street Journal. So I mean... This became truly a, a phenomenon uh, of news, even in the regular news venues. So, wild stuff. That's all the news for this time. I probably should put a note here that we, we, we skipped over some stuff. I will do that right now. Watch me do that, hopefully. And let's get over to strategy and tactics. I'm so slick. I'm slick. I can just roll with the punches here. No, no internet, how nothing. Many, how many episodes do we need already? 300, 200? 282, I just announced. We get the thing going, yeah. We got, we got it going here. Remember everybody, strategy and tactics, we have a contest going. However, we're gonna end this contest. You know what, I'm gonna end this contest on July 20th, which is gonna be the day after this podcast drops, which means you have a chance, if you hear this, to put the questions in the guild, in the correct thread for strategy and tactics. And you know how to do this, because you've been listening forever. Right? You go over to the guild, you find it where it says strategy and tactics, post it there. And I want to tell you, besides winning games from Ignasi, winning Podfather merch, like this amazing shirt that I'm wearing here, like w winning Corey merch. He's not here. Why is he not here? Don't know. He should be here at Dice Tower because he's a Dice Tower guy. Also, Mark Spector from Grand Gamers Guild, who publishes hit games like Endeavor, Artemis, and the Holiday High Jinx Game Lines is also going to give away packs of those Holly seven micro games. He'll be sending to a winner in the U.S. and somewhere else. We'll be pulling those sometime in late July. Last chance to put in your questions. Eight possible prize packs. All right. So what do we have here? Paul Marchbags. I know the guy. You know this guy. He's at the Dicey Review. He says, I know this has been discussed about how AI will influence the industry in the coming years. I'm already, however, seeing a lot of games being posted in large board game groups with some of it, some of it, not most of it, art AI generated. Covers, cards, the entire marketing package for the Kickstarter. I'm also envisioning the day when many games will be at least initially, if not fully generated by AI prompts. I have a friend who is currently playtesting a game who is completely AI generated with prompts input by the person. I have no idea if it's any fun as I haven't played it yet. But, but. All right, so number one, question number one of two. Paul, that was a big introduction there. Is AI art problematic? from an ethical and economic standpoint? Should artists be worried that more and more art 
will be good enough that people will opt to go this route, even with the slightly <clears throat> weird artifacts and details that AI will throw into the game. Does this infringe legally on his work, seeing how the AI pulls from existing media? So I, may I go first in this one? Because I, I have an opinion and I have a practical application from my buddies at Stronghold Games. So, leaving out the, for the moment, ethical stuff, AI artwork will be a tool, just like other tools that one uses when you, when you get, when you, when you generate art, when you, when you use pieces of Photoshop and this and that, and all these other all tools, it's gonna to become a tool. So you can generate a piece of art, but then the artist, another artist, is then gonna clean it up and add some stuff. So it's just a way of starting. And there's other tools right, that are out there right now that begin the artwork for you, and then you add onto it. So that's the first part. And my friend Bill Bricker, I've mentioned him many times, has said this exactly. I told him to write an article and get it onto ICV2 because his perspective as an artist was brilliant on this. Now, from a crediting perspective, this AI software, can easily spit out, I took it, I, it took reference from this, 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 and you can cite references, which, you know, you're always allowed to draw inspiration as an artist and you can cite references. So it can do that very easily. You see, references and, and stylistic choices what came from these things. All of that's possible, and I would say all of that should be done in the end when this matures a little bit more. Ignacy, any comments on this? Is the future? It will. It's. It's. We are not going to stop it. It's a new tool to use. Uh, at some point, the artists start using uh, Photoshop. At some point, they start using tablets. This is just a new tool that you need to learn how to use and uh, be great artists with that. Yeah. And you will not stop it. It's. It's happening. Right. So. 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 <clears throat> figure ways of of using the tool. You know. And you know you're still going to be doing art, but your art might be assisted by an AI, and I think that's a good way of thinking about it. Does AI design worry you? I know many game designers already take ideas or expand or rework. Okay, so this is about AI is designing board games. So this is all on you. Does an AI designing a board game actually intimidate you? It, it does not. I intimidate you, does, does, does this intimidate it, it you? It does not, but I fully, I fully understand and uh, predict that it will happen, yes. Uh, there's no way that these AI models will not be smarter than us in a year, two years, five years, ten years uh, window. And uh, they will write better rule books for our games, they will create some better economy for the games. And uh, once again, we can use it as a tool to support our design, or we can uh, give them interesting uh, feats, uh, these prompts, uh, ideas, and say, we do a game with this idea and this idea and this idea and it will split off uh, their ideas and yes it's, it's coming yes uh, i i'm really surprised with all those people who are uh, yelling and whining that this is destroying stuff this is this is life we have the uh, cars changing the horses we have like this is this is part of the life a new new new, new inventions and yeah it's happening technology is not going to stop it's it's, it's the course of human evolution. So we figure out ways of embracing it and using it as, as well and as good as we can. When I create a new game and I fake what say, steal from other designers' ideas and I take uh, from uh, Underwater City's idea and I get from Dominion idea and I get from this idea and I'm creating a uh, new stuff, I will not be angry if AI will steal some ideas from Robinson Crusoe and some ideas from Detective because we all do it. We all create the new games by using the ideas from other, other people. Great way of putting it. Fabian Canus. Fabian, Fabian. Fabian Canus says at Fabian C. Um, Here's a thought I'm having about crowdfunding. I'd love to get your input. When Gloomhaven or Eleven go to crowdfunding, the designer and the publisher is essentially the same person. It's not always the case. In those cases, it is. Uh, but when, say, Queen Games, okay, does a Kickstarter, like for the new Feld game, the publisher and the designer are two separate people. True. So it can be either, either way. Um, in traditional publishing, the revenue is split between the retailer, the distributor, 
publisher and the designer. The designer usually takes a pretty low percentage. So he's gonna, he's very long, very long. Uh, he finally goes, in short, when a crowdfunding platform is used solely as a pre-order system, thus reducing the risk of the publisher, shouldn't the designer get a higher cut? The answer, I don't know if you wanna take it, the answer is no, because the revenue is higher, right? The revenue is higher, so they are getting a higher amount of money anyway, right? Your statement about the splitting of revenue between the different people, um, in a traditional model, designer is getting a cut, a small cut of what the publisher gets, which is smaller than the full amount. Now, the, the publisher gets the full amount, so you're getting the same percentage, which is a bigger amount of money than the smaller. Am I explaining that right? If the game was $100, normally $40 would go to the publisher, the designer would get 5% of that or 10% of that, some number like that. Now, if they're getting $100, you're gonna get five or 10% of that, a higher number. Ignacy, anything else to add? Yes, with, with, with Eleven, actually, it is uh, published as Portal Games. The designer is Thomas Jensen. He's not part of the Portal Games. So we have a contract with him. Um, and yes, uh, without getting into the details, when we were negotiating with him, we were putting in the contract information how much he gets from the Kickstarter and how much he gets from the re retailer edition and regular distribution. So it was discussed. So yes, we as a publisher, and on top of that, you have uh, with Eleven, it's not true, but it, it might be true as well. No, we add to the contracts also the information how much revenue would get the designer if the game will become uh, digital. So he gets revenue from iOS and from Android right. store. So you have uh, these three different uh, paragraphs in the in the contract: Kickstarter, the regular distribution, and right. a possible e-adaptation of the game. Right. So the, you'll have those different th different pieces of it. There's always an electronic one. Yeah. That's always part of these contracts too. So sure. So there'll be tweaks and different things like that. But the basic statement that I made is: publisher makes making more money per unit. Therefore, designer is going to get more yep. in overall. Take one more, which we kind of have an abbreviated, and we have gone pretty pretty well. But this one's a great one. It's from Elizabeth Hargrave, nice. the Elizabeth Hargrave, the designer of the best-selling game Wingspan. <clears throat> and she's making a funny thing here. She's at Eliz, E L I Z Harg. I'm writing this in April, and Corey has already been on the podcast for a while. When will the strategy and tactics intro stop saying Stephen and Ignacy answer your questions? She put a little smiley face on there. So I, yeah, I do have to go out and redo all these things, the intro, the outro to this. I would, so, I would say that Corey is still an intern. He's an intern. Yeah, yeah. he doesn't really count because he's not here. I, I think like that <laughs> if he celebrates with us 100 episodes, we can adjust our bumpers. Yeah, sure. This is how we work at, at Portal Games. Uh, each new employee has his, uh, you know, few months of uh, we are checking. He's, he's on a trial basis. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he's not really. We will not change the bumpers right now, and maybe we will not happy with Corey, and we will leave the show. Like, I mean, I'm the only person that has appeared on every episode of Board Games Inside. You realize I, that? I'm, so maybe you're not really. True. I'm the second most often person of this podcast. Corey is fine beh behind me, so he's quite a bit behind. He needs to deserve his bumpers. <laughs> And with that, let's get to playtesting. Paula is going crazy over there. All right, so last week, um, we asked a question. Oh, and um, do you know Valentin Cretton? Do you know him? Okay, well he, we had his name all over last episode because, because there was like two questions by him. Uh, one of them was about edible board games. And then we used that idea in the question, and the question last week that I asked was, if a publisher brought out a fully edible board game, would you buy it? Assuming that the game is A, good, your style of game plays in your favorite game length, tasty, you would actually eat whatever it is made of, and C, priced reasonably for you, and that's subjective, right? Some people say, oh, I'll spend $100 on a game every day. Some people say, $20, top thing I ever do. So. All of that in consideration, would you buy a fully edible board game? And we got a pretty good number of, of responses here. And I'm gonna grab just some random ones on here. Bonnie Dorian, who's, oh, Mad, I know Mad Bana. She goes, no, I was taught never to play with my food. But in all honesty, I'm more picky about what I eat uh, than what I play. So 
I'd have a hard time unless it was a brand name food I was comfortable with. So there you go. Um, edible means that you can eat it? Edible. Edible. Oh, you don't even know the name of the, you don't even know the word. No. Edible. You can eat it. Food is edible. Okay. You can eat it. Oh, you, yeah, he's learned a, learned a new word here with us. I don't think that I would use it a lot in so, my life. But so let me, let me ask you, if someone brought out a fully edible, so like Catan had something, there was like a chocolate Catan, but it was just like the tiles, I think. And you know, you just ate it. But if somebody, so if, like Imperial Miners, if that thing was fully edible, would you buy the game, assuming it was a perfect game for you? Perfect game length, would you buy it? I'm not sure if I would feel comfortable. You're a more picky you, eater than most people. Yeah, yeah, if I feel comfortable, if you play with my tokens and then I need to eat it, like, no, thank you. You would not buy this game? No. So, <laughs> board game fangirl says, maybe more like advent calendar style with chocolate or something. So she's more about, you know, not exactly, you know, an edible game. Uh, Eric Langenbach says, He'd rather have a drinkable game, not an edible game. Uh, and there's Valentin, who was this who's question inspired. We're gonna take his, reminds me of a question I wrote somewhere. Yes, he wrote it to us. I absolutely would, especially a candy, a candy I split you choose. What a great game idea. You can force your opponent to take flavors they like less in order for you to keep your favorites. Oh, Valentine, we may steal this idea and design this game. Oh, that's a good one, right? Yeah, prompt chat GPD for that and you will have the full rules for that. <laughs> that's great. Uh, and Ann W, who's been here hanging out at the convention uh, with us, uh, at Ann Skater. Um, I was hoping the new game, Link to Delete, would have an edible, I don't know what that means. Oh, maybe it couldn't bring that up. Um, Sadly, she, she quoted a game here, but my internet can't bring it up. Um, I do not want to eat anything that has to be handled by others, is what her statement was. She does not want this thing. So that's basically, I think the basic answer is no. I do not want to eat a fully edible game. But I think the question was excellent anyway, and thank you, Valentine, for inspiring this. Ignasi, you quickly came up with a great question here to ask everybody for next week. What is it? Yeah, everyone ask uh, when the pre-orders for Imperial Settlers, Imperial Miners start. So I came with a question about the pre-orders. And the question is, if you were to pre-order a game from the publisher, what factor would make you do this? Would it be uh, early shipping, uh, special discount, extra goodies or whatever else that makes you decide that you will get it directly from the publisher instead of your, your local game store, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when you say you're talking about pre-order, not necessarily a Kickstarter, right? So you're pre saying like, talking about pre-order. Right, so a pre-order, you find out about a pre-order, like for Imperial Miners, for instance, goes up on a website. Will you get it from the publisher or from the local game store? And if from the publisher, what makes you do that? What would do that? So back in the Stronghold days, uh, we used to uh, offer early shipping. We did, At first we ordered a discount too, but then, you know, they started getting a little dicey with distributors not enjoying that, so we stopped that. But we'd always guarantee you're gonna get the game first. Um, and uh, we'd offer free shipping with that. So that's the way that we did it. Um, for me, um, I, if I really want something, I would do it based on, uh, based on getting it early, I guess, because, you know, I'm not all about getting every little bit like extras. I mean, yeah, there was some cool extras maybe. Um, and I don't, not a discount, I don't care much about discounts. So I, I'm about, you know, if I want it, I'll take it early, that's cool. Um, and maybe if it comes with some good things. I, I myself, uh, as our listeners know, I'm a huge fan of GMT games, yes. uh, notable publisher. And I use their program P500 yes. to pre-order games directly from them because I appreciate the company. I want to, them to have my money in, the, in their pocket. And uh, yes, they, have, uh, they are giving a discount, but to be honest, this discount is eaten by the shipping cost. So yeah. basically this discount doesn't exist anyway. Uh, but I got this game early, mm -hmm. and I'm happy that my money are directly at, at their account. Uh, and yeah, this is this amazing moment when they finally ship the game, and I'm on this, all the forums for the GMT games, and you see people showing the game, yes, I got it, I got it, and you are part of this 
amazing event that takes like two weeks that everybody just practices. I have it, I have it, and everybody uh, brags about it. So it is always fun, and I just received the Mr. President, a new game from GMT, and it was fu fu fun moment. That I know it is not yet in stores, nobody else have it except us who pre-ordered the game. So it is very nice. Very, very cool. What would you guys do? Let us know if you were pre-ordering a game from the publisher directly, what factor would make you do this? Shipping, discount, goodies, or other, and tell us what other is. I'm gonna put that up on the website within the next hour or two when Ignacy goes away and I can do some work. Um, and go to the guild on Board Game Geek and look for the playtesting thread with this question, answer it, and hopefully we'll read it on the air. And in the meantime, it's the final scoring. Thank you so much for listening. Help us spread the word about this podcast by telling your friends to download Board Games Insider wherever they like to get their podcasts or watch Board Games Insider on the Pod Father of Gaming YouTube channel. You want to be part of the podcast? You can. Just ask us questions. Last time to be part of the contest, too, for the strategy and tactics segment by posting them in the correct thread on the Guild on Board Game Geek. Also, answer our question to you for our play testing segment by going to our Guild on Board Game Geek and looking for that thread. Check out our websites, portalgamesus.com, podfathergaming.com, dicetowerdish.com by the intern, Corey Thompson. Uh, we are also all over social media, so interact with us on Facebook, like our pages, slash Board Games Insider, slash Portal Games US, and slash Podfather Gaming. You can speak directly to Ignacy, Corey, Steven, Twitter, Instagram, and maybe on uh, threads soon. <laughs> Another one. At Portal Games US, at Podfather Gaming, at Dice Tower Dish, at Dice Tower Now. I actually set up an account yesterday on Threads. I haven't posted yet. Maybe, maybe not. The very active YouTube channels are Portal Games Movies, The Podfather Gaming, and Above Board TV, and TikTok, Ignacy, Portal Games US. We really would love to see you in person at an upcoming convention in 2023, just like we saw so many fans here. If you come up and see us at any of these conventions, we want to do that. Take selfies with us. Let's talk for a little bit. Let's play a game. Let's get a beer, whatever you like to do. Board Games Insider was professionally edited by Joshua Bowman from Tabletop Submarine Podcast. If you want your podcast edited by Joshua, reach out directly to him at tabletopsubmarine at gmail.com. And that great voice you hear doing the intro, outro, and in-between segments, who's going to have to get contracted to redo them now based on Elizabeth Hargrave's comments is that of Ray Greenlee, and he can be contacted to do voiceover work at raygreenleevoiceover.com. And that's it. Anything else to announce today, Ignacy? Pre-orders for Imperial <laughs> Miners starts August 18th. I know my dates. Very, very good. August 18th. I am going to be at the WBC in Pennsylvania, in two weeks, like a week after this drops. I hope to see some of you there, probably the older guys that listen to this, because it's a lot of old people go to that convention. But I'll see you there if you're gonna be there. Or I'll see you at Gen Con the week after that, because I'm just crazy and I can't stop traveling. But I love gaming conventions and I love gamers and this is what we do. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Where to stop right now? <laughs> I don't know. Click something. <laughs>